Welcome to Walk in the Spirit, an expository teaching of God's Word with Pastor Brian Griffin. Walk in the Spirit is an outreach ministry of Pocatello Baptist Church. It is our prayer and desire that with the help of this message, we will all learn to walk in the Spirit. I spent a lot of time praying about and thinking about what epistle I wanted to go to after we completed the book of Romans. And, and uh, I was actually debating about going into the book of Galatians. And then the Lord really impressed on my heart the book of James. And I think partly because, uh, one, it's so rich with so many great doctrines and so many great instructions for us as believers. But two, because it was a different writer. And, and I, I love the idea of looking at how we're going to, be able to compare so much of what the Apostle Paul says to what the book of James is going to teach us. And how the Gospels, are, or how, how the Bible itself speaks to itself. And this is part of how we know this is the divinely inspired Word of God. Even though the men may have a different way of presenting or teaching or speaking or writing, that the doctrines and the truths of those things remain consistent. And so I uh, settled on the book of James, and I hope that you uh, all will be just as excited about this as I am. To begin with, by way of introduction, uh, the author, obviously we see there in chapter 1, or verse 1 of chapter 1, says, James, a servant of God. Now this is James the just, this is not James, the one that we refer to as the great, uh, the, John, John, uh, the Gospel of John, brother James, uh, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he was James that was there at Jerusalem. He was, if you would, the uh, father there at Jerusalem, the one that Paul would speak so much about going and meeting with and talking with. James the Great, James the brother of John, was killed by Herod um, early on, about AD 21. Uh, so we know that this is a different author here. The time around uh, this book, we don't know the exact timing or the date of this book. We do know that uh, James was martyred, this James was martyred around A.D. 61. And it's estimated that he wrote the epistle sometime before that, approximately maybe A.D. 46 to 49. Uh, by way of that, this makes this the oldest epistle that we have in the New Testament. If you would, this is the beginnings of the New Testament, if you would. The account of James' martyrdom is a pretty interesting one, though, and such that the scribes and the Pharisees, in an attempt to enlist James' help uh, to put to rest the continuing growth of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and in particular for those who were coming now to the Passover, took hold of James, restraining him, and made him to stand on the pinnacle of the temple, where he might be seen and heard of all the people, where they assumed he would deny Jesus for fear. They accordingly placed him there, and they said to him, O oh, just one, he had a respect amongst many as being a just person, to whom we all give heed, and as much as people is gone astray after Jesus, who was crucified, tell us what is the gate of Jesus. Now can you imagine for a moment here before we go past this point, that James has been placed on the pinnacle of the temple. In other words, he's been set on that peak above the temple there. And they're asking him this question. And an audience full in the temple square there. Of, of, of Jews. And they asked him, thinking that he would be afraid for his life and thought that he would deny the Lord Jesus Christ, but he answered with a loud voice. What a great opportunity to preach now. And he says these words, Why ask ye me concerning Jesus, the Son of Man? He sits in heaven on the right hand of the mighty power. And he is also about to come in the clouds of heaven. Many being convinced that that same then that they began to cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. James got the opportunity there in, uh, in, in this moment to, to have a testimony of Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees and the scribes are the ones who gave him the opportunity. I love that idea because I think what, what we really realize even in this martyrdom is, is this idea now that James stood there boldly proclaiming his faith and his love for the Lord Jesus Christ despite what fears he wrestled with. I will hope that one day I would have the same tenacity, that I would have the same boldness as the Apostle James here does. It says that after they said this, the Pharisees said, we have done ill in furnishing so great a testimony to Jesus, no doubt. Let us go and cast him down. They went up and they threw him down headlong off of the pinnacle. And as he was not killed by the fall, other accounts tell him tell that he was bound, that he was rescued, and, and held up by angels as we came to the ground, they began to stone him. 
And he, turning around, knelt and said, I beseech thee, Lord God and Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But while they were st thus stoning him, one of the priests of the son of Rahab cried, saying, Stop! What do ye? The just one prays for you. And one of them, one of the fullers, a blacksmith, what a fuller was, took the club with which he used to press and struck it in the head of the just one. And so he bore witness, and they buried him on the place by the temple. So he got cast off at that pinnacle, survived that, began to get stoned and started to pray for those that were stoning him. And one man, in the, caught up in the moment, took his club and killed James. Now, can you imagine for a moment, though, being tempted even though Lord Jesus Christ was? You'll remember that in Luke's account of the temptations of our Savior, it says in Luke chapter 4, verses 9 through 13, it says, he, speaking of the enemy, the, the devil, he says, he brought him, speaking of Jesus, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou, thou, thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said unto, unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. <laughs> there are going to be some great instructions in here for us. But I love the fact that James, is, James stood in the same place at one point that his Savior did. And was tempted with the same idea of denying God, God Almighty. And under the boldness of the Spirit of God was able to give the same answer, though the result was different. We're going to learn some great instructions as we study this epistle together. I mean, just in chapter 1 alone, look at in verses 1 through 4, we're going to talk about having joy in our trials. Verses 5 through 8 in chapter 1, we're going to talk about being not double-minded double, double -minded people. 9 through 11, we're going to talk about how a life is fleeting. 12 through 15, this is just chapter 1, where temptation comes from and its dangers. Verse 18, the source of all good and blessings. Verse 19 through 25, being doers of the word and not hearers only. Verses 26 through 27, guarding our tongue and what pure religion really is. That's just chapter 1. And we have more chapters than that to go through. So let's just jump into it right now this morning. Let's just begin again by reading verses 1 through 4 to get the flavor again uh, for ourselves, if you would. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into your first temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. <laughs> Oh, wow, you can just tell from this already that it's going to be fun. I remember once that we had gone to a pastor's conference with the deputies in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Pastor Colin and I had decided that it would be a good idea for us just to drive straight home through, straight through to get home for Sunday morning. Well, it was a 22-hour drive alone without any stops. And we figured since we had four drivers, myself, Chandra, Colin and Leslie, that, you know, with two vehicles, we could just take shifts and there'd be no issue at all. So we began to drive. Well, the problem was that the conference didn't get out until 10 p.m. in Chicago, 9 o'clock our time. We got on the road. So by our estimation, though, we thought we'd be able to drive and be back home by 10 or 11 Saturday evening, and then we'd be able to get a good night's sleep and be good to go for Sunday. We had already planned this, and we had never planned for a, a pulpit fill to come in. So we had also planned that Pastor would preach Sunday morning, and I would preach Sunday evening to give us both just the opportunity not to have to have two services to do. And we had no pulpit fill planned. Well, so we did this. But unfortunately, there were some factors that we didn't account for in our, uh, in our planning. First of all, trying to sleep in a car. In particular, in a car that has a bunch of young children in it. Didn't work out too well for any one of us who tried. Now, that would have been enough if you would have thought to make us think that, well, that may not have been a good idea. But there were some more things we hadn't accounted for. For example, for, for example um, how often we would eventually need to stop just to get a second wind, to kind of refresh ourselves and stuff like that. So we made a lot more stops than we accounted for. We just thought, we'll stop for gas, everybody can stretch then, and we'll get going again. That did not work out that way. We ended up stopping for mills so we get an opportunity to be out of the car and things of that nature. 
We didn't account for the fact that there were going to be children in the vehicles. And children had a lot more needs for stops than the adults did. Uh, that contributed to the number of stops that we made. And there was, of course, construction zones that we didn't account for that would slow our progress. We also didn't plan for the fact that the further we got and the drowsier we were, the slower we would drive. We had, uh, we had been up since 6 a.m. The, the, the day of the conference, Friday morning. And uh, we, uh, so we were planning on leaving that night and driving all through the night. And, of course, this meant we were going to be going, uh, give or take, approximately 48 hours without sleep. So we got pretty drowsy. Well, I remember that when it was about, uh, we, 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 having driven so much, about 27 hours at this point, uh, with little naps here and there, that we were all exhausted and we stopped in Kemmer, Wyoming. We only had three more hours to go. Three more hours to go to get home. So we all got in our respective vehicles at that time. It was at this point that we made the Death Street kiddos get out of our vehicle and get into theirs. And we just took our son. We figured this way, when we got to Pocatello, they could go home and we could go home and there'd be no more stops. So we got and we got going. Pastor Cohen and Leslie stopped in Soda Springs. We kept going. Called them and said, if I stop now, I'm not going again. I mean, I've never wanted to stay in Soda Springs more in my entire life. <laughs> and so we kept going. We kept going. So it was about this point as I was flying down the road at about 45 miles an hour that I honestly felt like I was pushing my speed a little bit. I thought, I don't know if I can handle this speed. And uh, I was just so going so fast. And it was at this point that Chandra began to hallucinate. She would scream every couple minutes, dear! Now, I have to say I praise God for that because had she not been screaming every couple minutes, there's a good chance I would have fallen asleep. But that actually kind of got me excited and woke me back up and I was able to keep going. So uh, and then we finally reached Interstate 15 down there at, 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 um, at uh, McCammon. We got on the interstate there at McCammon, and at that point I increased my speed to a whole 60 miles an hour. Set the cruise control, thought I could handle it. I remember it was all the way from McCammon until we got into our home almost that Chandra kept saying to me, I feel like we're careening out of control. How fast are you going? Now... Why do I share this story with you? Well, I can tell you that as we got home, we finally got home about 4 a.m. in the morning. We were able to get a couple hours of sleep before we had to get up and be here to church. We were exhausted. I praise God. I mean, I know it was a spirit working that morning and teaching that morning because there was no way that any of our minds were engaged. Now, as we got here to the church, I remember how exhausted we were. The Lord gave us strength. Now, but what do I share this story for you this morning? What does it have anything to do with what we're going to talk about? Well, it's because this morning I want to give praise to God for the patience that he gave our wives. Because in all honesty, our wives had to put up with a lot. They, showed, they exercised an incredible amount of patience. Never once did they express to us out loud how stupid we were. <laughs> Never once did they tell us how they wished they had not married us and their mom told them not to. They didn't tell us any of those things. They just showed their patience with us, even though they certainly could have not. So what had made Chandra so patient with me? Well, I wish I could tell you that this was just something that Chandra has innate in herself, but I can only tell you that it's because this is not the only time Chandra in our marriage has had to put up with bad planning on my part. She has learned, and I praise God that he has used me to help her to teach her patience. <laughs> I knew there was a reason why she married me, and it was because she needed to learn something, right? No, but in all honesty, the truth of the matter is, is that in those moments when we feel the weakest and the most out of control, that we need to be willing to exercise the most amount of patience. We need not get anxious and come up with our own plans. We need not sit there and try to make life difficult for others because we're impatient with them. It is in those difficult times that truly your character is going to come out and whether or not you have learned patience. So, let's just get into it. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. 
I want to pause here for a moment before we get into this idea of counting all joy with the diverse temptations, the trying of our faith. I want to look at verse 1 for a second, if you would, with me. James, a servant, the doulos, a bondservant, this, this concept uh, that we wish, I wish we all could truly grasp a hold of in our own lives, this idea of being that doulos, that bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we could totally change our, our, our understanding of this, it would entirely change our perspective of how we think about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't say that uh, flippantly. I honestly believe if we could catch hold of this idea of being a servant of the God and of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, our relationship with him would entirely change. See, do you see that it says here that we are servants, right? See, the idea of a bond servant is this. It is not that we are enslaved again to the Lord Jesus Christ because if we were enslaved by him purchasing us on that cross when he died for our, for our salvation, when he died for our sins, when he was put to death, buried and resurrected for our salvation, if that meant that we were now purchased by him and now became his slaves, then that is not a gift, is it? That is not a free gift either. See, we did not get purchased into slavehood again. Matter of fact, we got purchased out of it. And so he set us free. And we need to understand this because actually Christ's death upon the cross has set us free. He bought our debt certificate and made us free. In John chapter 8, we'll actually just turn there. John chapter 8, the Lord puts these words to us this way. In John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. He says these words to us. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, said, We be Abraham's seed, and we are never in bondage to any man. How sayest that thou, ye shall be made free? Which is funny, because I mean, we could talk about Egypt to begin with, right? And Babylon. But verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You see there how many times he wants to point out that we have been set free by him. That that is why he came here, was to set us free. We also see in there that he talks about those who are servants, right? Whoever serveth, wh wh whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Now, does that mean we're not servants of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we know we should be. We should be. I, the Lord has come. He has made us free, free from the flesh and free from sin. If you recall with me from Romans, well, actually just turn there, Romans chapter 8. You remember when we went through Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 10? The Apostle Paul gave us these words of instruction. Speaking of our freedom and of our having been set from free, free from sin. This is what he says in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is death, to me, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So be that, ye, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay. Uh, what I want to point out here is this idea that we were in the flesh. We were sla slaves to sin. We were slaves to the flesh. But if we are in Christ, we now have that Spirit of God that has freed us from that law, the law of the Spirit, or the law of the flesh, excuse me, the law of death, if you would. We are now have been made free. But we can choose now, having been set free, how to live. See, that is the point, isn't it? Once you have received your freedom, some of our young people who are going on to college right now, and maybe they're moving out of their parents' house, maybe they're not, but they think they're adults because they're, you know, they're old enough and all that stuff. And I shouldn't say it that way. That sounds very condescending. 
you are adults. We respect you as adults. But understand, as long as you're under, the, under somebody else's household, you don't get that freedom to make every decision for yourself. But the truth of the matter is this. We understand when we moved out from underneath our parents' rule, parents rule we took our own life into our own hands, we became our own people, so to speak. We experienced freedom, didn't we? Now, we had an opportunity at that point to decide what we were going to do with the freedom that we had just received. Likewise, you have that same opportunity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once he has set you free from the law of sin and death, once you are set free from the flesh, no longer to have to sin, you have a choice. What are you going to do with your freedom? What are you going to do with your freedom? Galatians 5.1 warns us this way. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, do you understand what that's telling you right there? That's saying that Christ has made you free. You are free now. But he's giving you a warning. Don't take your freedom and put yourself back into the bondage of the flesh. Back into the bondage of your sin. So then, why would James now, having been set free, choose to identify, identify himself as a servant? Very simply stated, it comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 10 through 23, when Paul puts it to us this way. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lived, he liveth unto God, speaking the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this. Likewise, reckon ye, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered, uh, delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as, as ye have yielded your members servants to unrighteous, uncleanliness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when we were, when we were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had, fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For if the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you understand what he's saying there? And I'm just going to put it to you in plain vernacular if you don't mind. You are a servant. Period. Now he set you free from being a servant of sin. You no longer, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you no longer are enslaved to sin. But He set you free to become His servant by choice. You chose that. Just like the Apostle James chooses to identify himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When somebody comes to you and they ask you about yourself, what is the first thing you tell them? I mean, that's an honest question. I don't want answers from you guys right now. I know that would take a long time. But what is the first thing you tell them? You know, I'm assuming they already know your name. Do you tell them, well, I'm A, and name your position or your, your occupation? Or do you say, I'm a mother or I'm a father? What do you identify with first? What is the first thing that you choose to identify with in your life? Do you know how many conversations and how many protections we would have as Christians if the first thing we identified ourselves with was the Lord Jesus Christ? If the minute somebody comes up and asks you about you, the first thing you say is, well, I'm a, I'm a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how many conversations that would actually give us the opportunity to have? Do you know how many people would actually probably inquire of us about those things? Or even if they didn't, you know how many people that would protect us from? What do you identify with? What do you choose to identify with? See, you are a servant whether you like it or not. Because there's only two places you can serve in this world, and you will serve one or the other. 
You can be a servant of yourself or sin, or the enemy if you would, or you can be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I want you to understand something here. You can be a born again believer and still choose to serve yourself. We see it happen all the time, don't we? People are out for number one. People are all about their sin. Now, I will tell you this. When I see people going too far away from that and I see them sinning uh, way, you know, way more than they ought, honestly ought to, I have to ask, are they really a born-again believer? Now, I don't get to answer that question. Only they can. Only they can. But the truth of the matter is, you are going to be a servant of somebody. Now, part of our understanding of this idea comes back to the word servant, the doulos, a bond servant. Let me tell you about the difference between a bond servant and a slave. All right? A slave was somebody who was purchased and they had no opportunity. They had no choice but to have to serve somebody. That person owned them now, if you would. All right? We all understand that from American history, don't we? Okay? We understand what slaves are all about. We understand from world history. But this word is a little different. Actually, it's a lot different in, in the way we think about this word. This word is a bond servant. This word is that doulos. And it really means the idea of this. Somebody who has chosen to become enslaved to somebody. See, in other words, it's like this. I am set free. But because my master, whom I serve, was such a good master, made sure I was fed all the time, made sure I was clothed all the time, made sure I had everything I needed for this life, that, he, that I loved him, literally loved him, I would choose, I would go to him and i ask, can I be your servant? In other words, here's what I want. I want to be yours forever. There's nowhere else I want to be. And I would put myself into servanthood to him for the rest of my life. See, this is the choice, brother and sister, that we face with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can choose now to become his servant forever. Or you can choose to be your own. It's up to you. And by the way, he's a gentleman. He set you free. He's not going to force this upon you. But the truth of the matter is this. I challenge you to find a better master than our Lord Jesus Christ. I challenge you. You think you can do a better job? Well, you did a great job up until the point that he set you free, didn't you? I mean, in all honesty, what do you think that you can do to be better about this? Well, I know what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't have to get up at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning and get ready to go to church. Why? What else are you going to do with your life? You know, I mean, in all honesty, I mean, you're choosing now to become his servant. I don't want to spend any more time focusing on that. But this is so important. Turn back to our main text there in James chapter 1 now. This is so important to understand. This is what James is saying. And by the way, later on we're going to see that James identifies himself as a brother or a kinsman of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that one for a second. Right? We had Nathaniel and uh, Thomas out at our house to say hi to Jaden the other day. And as I watched those two interact, I thought to myself, can you imagine one of them saying to the other one, you can be my master? Right? What happens to us? We have a hard enough time doing that with each other, don't we? Right? Submitting authority to somebody else. But can you imagine two brothers, two people who were so close that way, who knew each other, grew up that way, identified with each other that way? I mean, there's a reason why most siblings don't work together. Right? Because one of them is the boss. I remember Jaden, when he was a child, he didn't have a sibling. We had Isaiah, right? Near, nearest thing, aside from Buddy, that he had to a sibling. Okay? <laughs> And, uh, and I remember that uh, Jaden and Isaiah, would always, they went through this period where it was like, you're not the boss. And Jaden would say, you're not the boss either. Right? Until finally we all got tired of yelling them that the bosses would really get involved, right? Me or Landon would get involved and we, hey, we're the boss. <laughs> right? Now the point of the matter is this, guys, is he's choosing, James is choosing to become a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope each one of you in here this morning has made that choice. To no longer serve yourself because there's going to be benefits to it, immense benefits to being, being under his tutelage, under his mastership, if you would. And there's big protections as well. Now, understanding now that we have the privilege of being servants, and I say that honestly, we have the privilege now of being servants of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll next, we'll, it will help us to make our next points. We are going to look at this morning. It will make them a little bit easier to swallow, so to speak. Looking at verse 2 now, he says these words to us. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. We're going to stop there for now. I want you to, if, you, if you're one of those people who feels comfortable underlining in your Bible, I want you to underline one word in that for me. All right? It is this word, 
when. When. See, I want you to understand that we are not not going to fall into temptations. We are not not going to have trials. All right? Unlike the prosperity gospel that we hear about all the time on TV and stuff like that, coming to Lord Jesus Christ does not make your life all of a sudden go, boom, look, I'm wealthy, I'm rich, everything's good, life is wonderful. All right? Because he promises us there and other places in the scriptures that we will have trials. You will have difficulties. So understand that when we fall, not if we fall into temptations, that idea of temptations, adversities, we put to the test. Do you understand that we will have trials, we will have temptations, but that, that does not mean that they have to be grievous to us. And as a matter of fact, look what the apostle says about these trials. He says this, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think of trials and temptations as a joyful occasion. Right? When I think about joy and what I understand of joy in my own finite mind, I don't think, well, that sounds like a good thing to do. Right? I don't run out looking for temptations and trials. I don't want to go out there and suffer. I, I mean, we, none of us want to suffer. Right? But he says to count it joy when you do. That karaha in the, in the Hebrew means to be, have a calm delight is what we're really talking about here. That's what joy in the Lord is all about, isn't it? Joy in the Lord is all about a calm delight. Meaning what? Does it mean that it doesn't bother you? That it isn't worrisome? That it isn't stressful? No. It just means that you understand. It's okay. It's okay. Ryan reminds me of Romans 8.28, and I, I'm not going to turn us there. Well, I'll just read it to you guys real quick. Um, Romans 8.28 says these words to us, doesn't it? It says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, I want you to just think about that for a second here. All things, does that mean our trials too? Yes. Does that mean the temptations too? Yes. All, of thing, all those things are of benefit. That's what that means, it works to the good. It's of benefit to us. That means it's good for us. Do you understand that? These things are good for us. Now, we don't think they are in our flesh, and that's the problem, right? Now, remember, we come back to verse 1. If we're no longer a servant of ourselves, then our trials aren't going to be nearly as difficult. But if you're serving yourself, your trials are going to be hideous. And that's just the truth. But if you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're in the midst of a temptation or a trial, you're going to understand God's got this one. He's going to get me through this one. You know why? Because your master does not want to lose you. Do you understand that? Your master loves you. Just like if you were a slave owner, and I'm not necessarily promoting owning, owning people, don't get me wrong, okay, guys? But if you were a slave owner, that was money. Those people represented money to you. They were of value to you. You protected them. I know we hear about the horrible treatment of slaves and stuff like that, but understand that really in all honesty, most slaves, and I'm not saying all, but most slaves were of value to their masters. They brought something to them. And so the master protected them, watched over them. Uh, did they abuse them? Sometimes, yes. But that, you know, that's neither here nor there. But they would abuse them. They wouldn't let somebody else to come in and abuse them. Right? They would try them. They would put them through trials and stuff like that. But they wouldn't allow somebody else to do it. Why? Because they were theirs. They were worth something to them. And how worthy are you? How much worth do you have to the Lord Jesus Christ? You have enough worth that he was willing to die for you. And you think he's going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle? Be tried beyond what you can handle? Count it all joy, my brethren. 1 Peter chapter 4 puts this idea of, of joy in a different light. Put this, 1 Peter chapter 4, read verses 12 through 16 with me if you would. 1 Peter chapter 4. Pick it up at verse 12 with me. We'll read through just the verse 16 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Excuse me. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye, ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached of the, for the name of Jesus, of the name of Christ, excuse me, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, as a busybody, and other men's matters. 
Yet if any man suffers, a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory God on his behalf. I love this idea here. Do you see there he says we should have an exceeding joy. We should be glad and have exceeding joy. What? When we suffer. That's what it says right before there. Rejoice when you suffer. Have exceeding joy. Why? Be glad because you're suffering because you're a Christian. Right? Our Savior said it this way in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. And shall say all evil manner against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. There is something I want you to notice in this passage. It's very instructive to us. Are you suffering for him or because of yourself? You notice he says that, right? In verse 15, he says, Let none suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, as a busybody, or any other men's manners. But if any man suffer as a Christian. Right? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. How do you know the difference? It depends on whose servant you are. That's really what it comes down to. Whose servant are you? Are you the Lord Jesus Christ's servant, or are you your servant? Because if you're your servant, you're going to suffer, because honestly, you're an arrogant person. Okay? But if you suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, then I don't care what area we're talking about. As a Christian, you suffer. You're going to have joy through it. You're going to be able to endure through it. But when you're suffering for yourself, you will not endure through it. You will not hold up under it. Because you'll be like, and I remember I had a friend who uh, used to get fired from every job he had. Right? And he used to tell me all the time, I got fired because I'm a Christian. Really? Why? What happened? Well, I missed work that one day because I had to go to this place and, and this conference and blah, blah, blah. And so you skipped work? You didn't tell them? You didn't take a day off or anything like that? No, no. I, I mean, it came up last minute, so I went. They fired me because I was a Christian. No, they fired you because you were stupid. They fired you because you were lazy and you weren't doing what you committed to do. And honestly, you were not a good representation of Jesus Christ either. Because Jesus Christ would have told you, hey, either get the day off or go to work. That's what he would have told you. Because you're representing me. But see, he kept thinking, oh, I'm getting fired because I'm a Christian. It's because I talk about Jesus all the time. I don't have a problem with somebody talking about Jesus all the time. Most people don't, as long as they do their job. Right? But if they're not doing their job, yeah, they're going to have a problem with you. And it has nothing to do with Jesus. That may be one of the excuses they'll use. But it's not the problem. Guys, I was a believer in my last job. I shared Jesus Christ all the time. But I did my job. I got promoted through the ranks in my job. I got, I got offered a better job when I decided to come take the, the pulpit here. I got offered something well beyond what I was already earning because my reputation preceded me. And I was a believer. And most of the people I worked with were not. So what was the difference between me and them? Was it because I was compromised and I was like, oh, no, your beliefs are okay? No. It was because I did my job. I was a good representation of the Lord Jesus Christ because that ultimately was who I worked for. It wasn't a matter of I got fired because I was a Christian. I mean, you may get persecuted as a believer, don't get me wrong. And you may even get persecuted to the point that you're like, I just can't do this anymore. This job is wicked. And that's okay too. You leave under your own accord that way, that's fine. All right? We all had jobs where we're like, I can't do this anymore. It's just wicked here. And that's okay. But rejoice in as much as you are partakers in Christ's suffering, that, you, that when the glory is revealed, you may be a glad author with exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. Turning back to our main text now. We can have joy in the midst of our struggles. Why can we have joy in the midst of our struggles? Because we understand, first of all, who it is we struggle or suffer for. And we also understand what the point of our suffering is all about. And that's why we can have joy. It doesn't mean that I'm all excited about it and happy and jumping up and down about it or anything like that or I'm asking for it. But the point of the matter is, in the midst of those trials, I can have joy because I understand, first of all, who I suffer for and second of all, what the point of that suffering is. You're like, what is the point of the suffering? Well, let's look. Read verse 3 and 4 with me. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. They may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Why do we suffer? So we might learn patience. Right? What is patience? It's endurance. 
By the way, notice that it says that it worketh patience. It's a labor. Do you understand that? So in other words, here's the point. Suffering is going to be laborious. That's the point. It worketh patience. It is laborious. You will only learn it through laboring through it. That is the point. Right? Now, we've all heard it said, right, before, don't pray for patience. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, good news, you don't have to. Because it's going to come anyway. All right? If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've yielded yourself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't need to pray for patience. It's coming anyway. All right? Don't even worry about it. The trials are coming. And I know that because it said, remember it said, when ye fall into temptations. It's not a matter of if. Right? I don't need to pray, God, give me more troubles. Okay? Give me more struggles, Lord, because he's going to bring the ones I need anyway. All right? So I don't have to worry about that anymore. I can take that off my prayer list. All right? I don't need to pray for that. He's going to bring it anyway. Okay? So the point of the matter is this. What I really want to pray, and we'll talk about that in a moment here, is I really want to pray, Lord, be glorified through this. Right? I'm your servant. Be glorified through this. Help me to be patient because you want me to be patient, Lord. Right? I'm reminded, well, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Read verses 1 through 4 of Hebrews chapter 12 with me if you would. I think of this idea of learning patience, learning how to endure, right? And this is one of the things that always pops my mind when I think of enduring. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. It says these words, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easy, so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not rested, excuse me, ye have not resisted unto, unto blood, striving against sin. Do you see this idea of endurance wrapped up in here? It says there, run with patience the race that is set before you. In other words, run with endurance the race that is set before you. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Consider in him that endured such a contradiction, the sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. Endured. Consider the endurance that he had. Consider the endurance that we can have because of him. And let's run with patience that race that is set before us. Now, as you all know, I'm not much of a runner. All right? Matter of fact, I like, the, like the old joke says, right? If you see me running, you better run too. All right? Because there's something coming. All right? Now, I'm not much of a runner, but I have talked to runners, okay? I'm trying to figure out what's the matter with them, but it doesn't matter, okay? I've talked to runners, and this is what I figured out talking to runners. Apparently, I have never gotten myself to this point, maybe to my shame, I don't know, all right? But apparently, when you're running, you get to a certain point where your body's like, that's it, I've got no more, I'm done. And if you'll just push past that point, you'll endure past that point. Something else takes over. I think, honestly, it's death. But, okay, but something else takes over and you're able to continue going. That's the idea behind this idea of running with patience and endurance. It's not only just bearing up under the normal weights. It's when those weights get so heavy that everything in you says, I can't do this, that you take your eyes off of yourself and what you can do, you put them on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you endure. That's what the idea really is. It reminds me of um, Eric Little. I don't know if you guys know Eric Little and, and who he was, an Olympic athlete, right? He's the one that we all, we all praise as Christians because he was selected to run in the Olympics, and they found out that the, the, the event he was supposed to run in was being held on a Sunday, and he refused to run in it. He held that day sacred for the Lord Jesus Christ. So he transferred to a different, by grace of his team and other teammates, they allowed him to go to a different event, one that he'd never run. Okay? And he went on to win. Now, I'm not here to tell you about the Olympic story. What I want to tell you about is how Eric Little ran. Eric Little ran like this. Okay? Let's assume, and I don't know how many laps he ran, but let's, just, let's assume he had eight laps to run. He would run the first four with his head down. And he always ran the last four with his head up. And somebody asked him why he does that. And he says, because the first four is under my strength. The last four is under Christ's strength. In other words, I got to the point that I couldn't go anymore, and the Lord picked me up from there and carried me on. 
And that's the point we're looking at this morning, guys. How do we suffer? How do we have joy in the midst of trials? Because we run as far as we can run, and then we look up and let him carry us the rest of the way. We endure because of who he is, not because of who we are. That's how we do it. Now, I have pushed myself to that point in other sports where I felt like I couldn't do any more, and I pushed myself past that point. I haven't done it in running. There's a very good chance I never will. Actually, there's probably a better chance that I'll win the lottery and I don't even play. All right? But the truth of the matter is this, guys. And by the way, I'm not making people, fun of people who run. The truth of the matter is this. You guys know that verse from Philippians that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I could run. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, when you're bearing up under the load and it's just more than you think you can handle and you think there's, just no, there's no end to this, I don't, see the, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, Lord. He's telling you, good, close your eyes and let me take over. Because I am the light. I am the light. He's telling us that. He's challenging us in that idea, guys, of running with patience this race that is set before us. Does that mean we're going to have, not have some miseries? Absolutely, we're going to have some miserable times. We're going to have some difficult times. We're going to have trials. I read to you already where it says that we will, right? But we can still do it with joy. A calm delight in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is using that not only to glorify himself, to get us to rest in him and to, to be his servant and to look to him, the author and the finisher of our faith, but also... To perfect us. Look back at our text now. Look back at our text. James chapter 1 verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Do you understand why we endure? Why he gives us the trials? It's so that we can be perfected. And by the way, I'm going to put it to you this way. Don't think that's going to happen here. But endure. Because you will one day be perfected. And you one day will be entire, complete, not lacking anything. Now, you may get better at it as time goes by. Some of the elders in this room who have been walking with the Lord Jesus Christ many years longer than us can probably tell us how endurance works and how it's okay. You can continue to go on. And that you can get through this time. Some of us who have suffered some major tragedies or trials in our life can look at it and say, I can endure past this point. And you can too. But the truth of the matter is, is this is the point, guys. We must endure. We must endure because if we endure, we're being perfected. But if you don't endure, you're missing the blessings. You're missing the point. This is why he's given it to us. Now, how many of you have ever said to yourself, I don't want to be perfect. I don't want to be entire. I don't want to, well, I don't want to be, have everything I need. None of us, right? We all want that for ourselves. So I got some good news and I got some bad news. It's available to you. That's the good news. The bad news is, there's only one way you get it. And that is through trials. That is through sufferings. That is through enduring. So rather than saying, don't pray for patience, might I suggest it this way? We as believers can pray for, not necessarily we're out praying for patience, like I said, it's going to come anyway. But maybe we should pray that when we are tried, we should pray, Lord, let not this trial be wasted. Let me learn. Let me grow thereby. Because I don't want to have to learn it again. That's the difference. And that's what brings joy. Is when you've been through it, you know you can get through it again. 
Thank you for studying God's Word with us on Walk in the Spirit. To hear more of this or other portions of Scripture, please visit www.pocatellobaptistchurch.com or you can write us at 190 West Chapel Road, Pocatello, Idaho, 83201. If you live in or are visiting Southeast Idaho, we would like to have you join us here at Pocatello Baptist Church for any of our services. Our service times begin with Sunday school at 9 a.m., Sunday worship at 10 a.m., and Sunday evening study at 5 p.m. We have a midweek study and prayer service for both adults and youth on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is available for all of our services. For more information or directions, please call us at 208-237-4915. Until next time, God bless you as you walk in the Spirit.